Yeah, FTZ. I bet you don't know what that means. We're going to tell you what it means. Uh, Tom Yamachika, uh, Talking Tax, the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Um, today is uh, Thursday and it's uh, 10 o'clock and that means it's Tom Yamachika, Talking Tax. Hi, Tom. Welcome back to your show. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Uh, thank you for having me on your show. <laughs> it's mutual. So, so today what is an FTZ? Tell, tell us slowly what it is. Sure. There are a number of uh, devices that, that the feds provide uh, to help exporters. And one, uh, one of these uh, is an FTZ, which is a foreign trade zone. Um, let, me, let me kind of show you a picture of one. Uh, this is foreign trade zone number nine. It's uh, next to Restaurant Row in, uh, the, uh, in downtown Honolulu here. And it's probably the biggest and one of the oldest foreign trade zones in the nation. What it is, is it's a geographical area uh, in or adjacent to a port of entry. So it, it's, it's gotta be close to you know, someplace where there's international traffic, uh, where commercial merchandise receives the same customs treatment as, it, as if it were outside the United States. So uh, what that does is it helps American businesses to be competitive uh, by, you know, if they want to produce goods for export, uh, they can bring those goods in, not have them subject to US tariffs, assemble the goods or otherwise manufacture them, and then send them off for export. So it never enters the United States, never, never uh, uh, gets subject to US tariffs. And um, so we have a number of businesses that set up shop in the zone uh, to load, unload, handle, store, manipulate, manufacture, and exhibit goods for reshipping uh, by land, water, and or air. Uh, and you, you may me, have heard about... Let me unpack a little of that. Sure. So this is down on the waterfront. It's a great big warehouse building <laughs> near the Immigration Service, as I recall. It's on the water. Um, That's right. <laughs> uh, Linda Lingle, I think, used that for the homeless for a while, that building. There was a steel, or maybe it's next door. There was a maybe steel company in there for a while. Um, but this is, the foreign trade zone has been there a long time. And I, I guess I, I'm really curious as to what the, you know, what do you want to call it, the federalism is. Is this a federal facility? Is it a state facility? It's who a federal facility. It? Federal facility. And the people who run it are federal managers um, and the tax exemption and all that, the carve out, so to speak, that's a federal carve out, but it also applies at the state level. I'm confused. Okay. Um, Foreign Trade Zone is a federal program. So, so the people who uh, are there and are kind of supervising it is uh, from Homeland Security. Okay, it's customs folks. So they're there to basically uh, police the area as if it were uh, outside the United States because it is for, for customs purposes. Uh, it, ours was established in 1966 at Pier 39. Uh, and it's now about 2,600 acres, so it's pretty uh, pretty big. And um, it's also very secure. There is a big cyclone fence around it. I'll tell you a short story. I I I I, I used to go out on weekends with my camera and take pictures of things. You know, just aesthetic experience. And one day I was in the front of that cyclone fence there. Uh, on the roadway between the foreign trade zone and Ala Moana. And I took a picture of, of the cyclone fence and the building behind it. And the security people came out and told me, no, 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 no. You cannot take a picture of the foreign trade zone. I said, you gotta be kidding me. Um, I won't tell you the rest of the conversation. <laughs> I thought that was absolutely absurd. Um, so did you, did you leave the fray with your camera? <laughs> no, that was the rest of the conversation. But let, let me let me only say that uh, at least some people think this is a highly secured area. How secured is it? Or maybe I should say, how secured should it be? 
well, it looks like you you found out firsthand how, how secure it actually is. Um, but uh, th there are other um, uh, federal devices that help, uh, you know, imports and exports. Um, you may have heard of duty free shops. Well, before you go to that, you, you talk about exhibits in that building in the foreign trade zone. Mm -hmm is operated what I think the Department of Commerce has something to do with it because they have a building right next to it. Um, in fact, on that map that you should aerial photo, their building is right there. Um, so my question is, uh, if I want to mm, assemble, if I want to exhibit, as you said, if I want to have, um, uh, you know, some geography in the foreign trade zone, I have to rent it. I have to enter into an agreement with the foreign trade zone and say, well, space SJ67 uh, is, is mine for a period of time and I pay rent. Am I right? I believe so. Um, actually, uh, it's under federal authority, but the, the people who actually run it is DBED. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but they were given a grant of authority um, by, and that there's actually a foreign trade zones board in Washington D.C. Uh, that has oversight authority over all this stuff. But they're carved. They're carved out of the state. It's like a special federal enclave, uh, which uh, the federal government controls and, I guess, um, you know, has jurisdiction over. But they allow DBED to come in and manage it. Is that what happens? Yeah, and and, and um, it's funny you should say enclave because it it's not, and that brings us to one of the principal points of dispute that we're going to be talking about later in the show. Okay. Okay, I interrupted you. Why don't you go go ahead with your conversation? <laughs> no, I I also wanted to mention that there were other, uh, you know, federal facilities that we pr we probably all know and love, uh, such as the duty free shop. Duty free shop is also an area that's considered outside of the US for uh, for customs purposes, so people can go in to a duty free shop. Uh, you know make a purchase, but the catch is uh, that they will not uh, be allowed to take the you know the the the, the um, purchase goods onto Hawaiian soil okay it's given to them. Uh, after they board the aircraft that's going to take them home. OK, so um, a, 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 uh, uh, a duty free shop uh, like the foreign trade zone uh, is another instance of uh, areas under special federal control or supervision uh, that are outside the customs territory of the United States. You don't want to say enclave. Huh? No, enclave is something different. Okay, and and so so let's get to that. There is a special provision in the U.S. Constitution that allows the United States to establish enclaves, and we have some enclaves uh, in various places of the country. Uh, so there are some federal buildings, courthouses, um, national parks, uh, you know, stuff like that, and. Uh, and some military bases. Uh, and, and the thing is that in federal enclaves, state laws just don't apply. What's, what's probably the most famous federal enclave that everybody you know, talks about every day? Washington, D.C. Mm, the whole thing. The whole thing. Yeah, it's carved out of Maryland and Virginia. Uh, it was actually bought by the federal government. And uh, it is a um an area onto itself I mean, it's not part of maryland it's not part of virginia no, none, none of those states laws apply you think it would be helpful if they sold the whole thing back to maryland and virginia and you know um did away with it <laughs> no, i think that would be i think that would be disastrous <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the feds, the feds have to you know, have their own space too. come on, you know. <laughs> anyway, okay. go ahead. But the thing that's different between 
federal enclaves, federal trade zones, and customs bonded warehouses, which is what a duty free shop is, is the extent to which state laws apply. Okay. That's a big difference. It's a big difference. Uh, in a federal enclave, it's not part of the state, basically. No state laws apply. In a federal trade zone or a customs bonded warehouse, state laws do apply. Uh, but some of them are pushed out. Like, for example, uh, if you try to uh, sell merchandise for export in a, uh, in a foreign trade zone uh, or in a, a duty free shop, um, state laws don't apply. So, GE, so the RGE tax doesn't apply. But, but, the, but the treatment only extends to the, the particular goods uh, that are uh, uh, getting export treatment. Yeah, okay. well, okay. I, mean, I can understand uh, duty-free. And I suppose uh, when you talk about duty-free shoppers, you shouldn't confuse that with the duty-free zone. Duty-free shoppers is a private company that has right. some sort of license or permit to operate uh, as a duty-free shop, yes. but it is a private retail organization, uh, like every other retail organization. But um, to focus on the federal trade zone, um, you know, the magic word is export. And uh, I, I'm racking my brain, Tom, to think of exports from Hawaii. I mean, uh, you know, Think Tech has been advocating for export of bloody everything that could possibly be exported um, from Hawaii, but you know, there's not a lot being exported from Hawaii. And I wonder if, if uh, the original intention is being met, um, the original intention being to incentivize, to make a, a, a facilitation of Hawaii exports. And certainly the Department of Commerce tries very hard to do that. And they even advertise to do that, but query whether there are uh, significant exports leaving our state so as to justify this large piece of property. Well, I mean, I think one of the uh, issues is that maybe the people who should know about it don't know about it. And that's one thing that we're trying to do on this show here is to educate people about what, what an FTZ is, what the uh, other uh, federal programs uh, are, that how it might help them if they want to do exports. Uh, so this, okay, is, this is why me, we're here pitch today. Me, pitch me. What's, what's in it for me with these programs and all to try to be an export? You know, one of the problems about uh, Hawaii traditionally, and this is especially so in government contracting, is it's complicated. You have to get the regulation book out and read it cover to cover so you don't make a mistake. And it's the same thing with foreign trade zone. You have to follow all these regulations about export. Um, complicated. And you know, that's on top of the all the other business considerations on selling stuff. So query, why would I go to the trouble of trying to export? Well, if you want to export, if you if you have uh, contacts or a market in a foreign country, for example. And you and you have something, or or can get something, um, uh, and and you have the ability to manufacture it or reassemble it in Hawaii. Okay, then uh, what you can do is get your uh, component parts or uh, manufacturing inputs from wherever you need to. It's not going to be subject to U.S. customs duties. Okay, because it's still outside the United States for customs purposes. Make your stuff, and then sell it to the sell it to the foreign country again, uh, without it ever entering either Hawaii or uh, the U.S. Uh, for tax purposes. So I avoid customs. You avoid customs, and you avoid stuff like the Hawaii use tax. Right, okay. which which runs at the rate of what half half percent. Uh, half or four, depending on whether there's a, a 4% sale following it. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if you're going to produce goods uh, for sale into the United States, then it really doesn't matter because the, 
because the duties are going to hit uh you know when when the stuff enters the enters the country and so the foreign trade zone doesn't help you then not not for not for imports for exports right right so we're only talking about exports so okay i have to do a lot of stuff to export and it is sexy to know that there are there are markets out there i mean say take asia take china there are billions of people out there all potential customers i suppose but we, yeah, we so, so, this, is, this is a hawaii specific um facility it's a hawaii specific export incentive it's a hawaii specific process well, uh, it's, it's not hawaii specific it's 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 uh, us specific okay you you can you can have foreign trade zones in new york or boston or anywhere that there is a a port of entry and and i i believe foreign trade zone number 1 is in new york mm. They they had to be the first. Okay, so does that mean that the people who rent space in the foreign trade zone here, um, on the waterfront here, uh, may be from other states, maybe companies um, you know who are um, simply coming here for the space in the foreign trade zone, so they can assemble their their manufactured uh, products and sell them. Well, um, but, but so, so so here's so here's the thing. Um, if a foreign trade zone were a federal enclave, they could do that no problem. Hawaii, Hawaii laws wouldn't apply. You wouldn't have to worry about GE tax. You wouldn't have to worry about use tax. You wouldn't have to worry about Hawaii regulations, okay, which, is, which is an issue when you have uh, like uh, food products because um, you would have to comply with the Department of Health regulations uh, in addition to the federal ones. And there are other regulations that are applicable to other industries that uh, that we impose on top of other states. And we have labor laws. Okay, if you were in a federal enclave, uh, you wouldn't have Hawaii workers' comp laws. You wouldn't have Hawaii SUI. Uh, all of that would be federally controlled. But in uh, you know, if, if you have an employee in the duty-free shop in in Waikiki. Uh, yes, Hawaii taxes are being withheld from their wages. And yes, um, uh, uh, they are paying workers' comp at the at the same uh, rate as other uh, Hawaii employers of the same size and and risk risk factor. Uh, and they are making uh, unemployment contributions into our state funds uh, because uh foreign trade zones and customs bonded warehouses are not federal enclaves now for for a while uh the our our state department of taxation got the two confused they thought mm, yes yeah, it sounds like a federal enclave so we're, we're gonna we're going to uh rule that uh our taxes don't apply and they did you know in the uh i think it was in the 70s 80s time frame they they did issue rulings. Um, but then guess what happened in in twenty twenty one. Um, I'm I'm going to pass on that guess and let you tell us what happened. They had an epiphany. Eureka! Foreign trade zones are not federal enclaves. And we need the money. And we need the money. <laughs> so they went after vendors of businesses that did business in the foreign trade zone uh like uh, you know if you had a contractor come in to fix the plumbing or if you had an electrician come in or or if you had uh if, if you're a little shy on people you needed a payroll service uh or get get some temporary workers you know that sounds completely reasonable to me yeah and the question then becomes do hawaii laws apply uh, to the in the in the foreign trade zones to that extent because you're not dealing with the goods, okay? And the answer is well, yes, it does. Um, contrary to the department's previous understanding, uh, they 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 now came to the realization that foreign trade zones are not federal enclaves, so taxes do apply. So they did what a typical tax agency would do. They sent letters to all, all the people they thought might be involved and said, give us back taxes for all open years. Oh, no. 
Oh no, that's now that's oh, not reasonable. Open the ears. That's not reasonable and that's not fair. Their, their epiphany should not permit them to do that. But that's what they did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and and a lot of businesses uh, that have provided services to uh, folks in the foreign trade zones are dealing with this issue now. Okay. Um, so we we can we can kind of think about well, what should the, uh, you know, what should the remedy be when you have a tax agency that just makes a mistake? Because they do, you know, they're human like anybody else. Uh, and, Why and do you question, say it was a mistake? It's a change in policy, wasn't it? No, it's it's a it's basically a conclusion of law. So, the mistake is, is was foreign, they should have taxed them before. That's correct. Okay. Yep. Uh, foreign trade zones are not federal enclaves. They never were. And um, the rulings they gave out to the contrary were just wrong as a matter of federal law. Well, and not so, as a matter of state law, because the tax we're talking about is state tax. Yes, that's true. Uh, but the federal law uh, question is whether the state, uh, the state tax law is preempted. And whether it overrides the state law. If it were a federal I, I, enclave. If, if, a, if a state did not want to collect state tax on a, a, a foreign trade zone, it doesn't have to. Yeah, it the, could pass the federal government is not requiring it to do that. They could legally exempt uh, activity within the foreign trade zone. No problem, right? Yeah, yeah, but they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. It's their own mistake. Yeah, uh, and it's a mistake that was a matter of policy kind of mistake. Anyway, I, I, I feel that uh, looking at retroactive taxation here is really wrong. But that's what they're doing. I mean, and, and the question becomes, OK, when the tax agency makes a mistake. OK, you keep calling um, it that. <laughs> well, we, we will we'll assume for purposes of the argument that it was a mistake. OK, who bears the consequences of the mistake is it is it the taxpayer uh who who got the unusually favorable ruling or uh at, to the expense of the uh all the people in the state of hawaii or the other way around i think the tax for a given period of time the um tax office has to live with its own ruling and, and well, so that, I, I say that the tax office has to live with its own ruling. And if it, it, did, it said it wasn't collecting the tax, it said it wasn't imposing the tax, then no tax. And if that means that the taxpayers of the state have to pay a little more to cover it up, then I mean, not cover it up, but make it up, uh, then that's, that's the way it is. And there are other examples of the same sort of thing where the tax office has decided not to impose a tax in a given situation. OK, it made a ruling, finished. Well, but there's a Supreme Court precedent that goes the other way. Uh, what, is the pre called, what is that president? Go ahead. Uh, it's, uh, I think, American Automobile Association uh, versus Commissioner. It's a US Supreme Court case involving the IRS. IRS had given a, um, an organization a ruling saying that it was a tax exempt organization. A few years later, uh, it realized that it made a mistake. It revoked the, uh, the exemption and said, you know, please give us back taxes. And the company, uh, not, not surprisingly, said, this is unfair. And the case went up to the Supreme Court and the, and the Supreme Court said, um, it's fair. That's, that's different. I would distinguish that here. Um, this was... This was a ruling covering, you know, the foreign trade zone. This was a ruling saying that these contractors and the like could come in and operate without having to pay state tax. Okay. Um, if there was a mistake, it was a conceptual mistake. If there was a mistake, it was a policy decision that they didn't have to make, but they did make. And it applied across the board, not to one company or in that case, nonprofit, but to everybody who, who did business um, in the in the facility, um, the Supreme Court case you talked about uh, involved one company, and um, I, I think that that is a true mistake. 
if you want to use the term mistake, and it differs. There are also Hawaii Supreme Court cases, a couple of them, uh, basically saying, and, and, and we can kind of debate the wisdom of this, but what they, what they hold is that if a state worker does something um, to impede the, you know, the sovereign taxing power of the state, uh, basically the uh, department is given a get out of jail free card. Uh, this this happened um, in the uh, um, travelocity litigation with the um, with the out of state uh, uh, sellers of you know tour packages, you know the Expedias and Travelocities of the world. Um, they uh, mm -hmm. entered into uh, a settlement with the department on. Uh, on hotel rooms, they signed off, they stipulated to judgment. And then, um, and the state comes back and goes, okay, here's round two. Round two is uh, car rentals. And, um, and, and the, and the, and the, uh, uh, the defendant company said, what? You know, we, 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 we stipulated to judgment for all of, the, all of these years and you're coming after us again. And the Supreme Court said, that's okay. Our Supreme Court said, that's okay. Um, you know, if somebody uh, signed the uh, stipulated judgments and, and uh, then it was a mistake, we're, we're gonna let the state get out of it because that's, that was an abridgment of the taxing power of the state. And that shouldn't be allowed just because somebody, you know, screwed up on on, on a couple of documents. Yeah. I suppose there are other states where that same kind of ruling was handled that handed down, but it strikes me as bad law. If I'm in court, you've been, you know, in this situation. If I'm in court and I'm litigating some issue, um, and I'm uh, in front of a settlement judge, and we argue and we and we um, take our positions and finally, um, this is involving one, one client, so to speak, one specific company involved in that litigation. And we make a deal and we rely to our detriment on that deal. And we either pay money or we in some other way rely on it. I think the state should be bound by that. Yeah, I, got, I have a case involving that, that very issue right now. And of course, what, that's, what position do you take? Are you taking? That the state's bound to the deal. Should be. Yeah. They can't change their minds. You know, I mean, people went through a lot of aggravation to get to the settlement. You can't undo a settlement because you had a change of mind. You're locked in as far as I can see. I don't know why the state should have any, any rights to get out of a settlement beyond the rights of individual parties. They're locked in. Yeah, but apparently the Supreme Court thinks differently, so. Bad that's, law. That's what we have to deal with. Yeah. Bad law. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> not not all precedents are correct, as you know. <laughs> but they are precedents, so that we just have to, you know, know that they're dear and know that they're there, and then deal with them. Yeah. Okay. All right. So where are we going with this uh, uh, federal trade zone? So the people are unhappy because the state's changed its policy. As I said before, I don't, I don't think that's uh, unreasonable, but I do think it's unreasonable making it retroactive for all open years. That sounds really unfair to me, particularly yeah. because there were rulings. Uh, they, they have the force of law, those rulings saying this was okay. To change the rulings effectively is what they're doing retroactively. And all right. these people were doing tax planning in all those years and, and relying on the rulings. Uh, it's the same thing. It's bad law. Anyway. Right. So, so, so maybe it's, it's time for the legislature to do something about it. I mean, they obviously can. Yes, they and, can. Uh, and perhaps they should. Yeah. Yeah. We have to do better. And, and actually, the Supreme Court has to do better. I mean, arguably, um, a lawyer representing one of those uh, contracting companies goes, takes it up, and he says, you know, gentlemen, this is bad law. How about changing the precedent? 
I know that's a burden, right? Not likely to succeed. Mm -hmm. Still, somebody had to raise these points of consideration. I mean, and the points, the policy points to me are, you have to have confidence in government. You can't enter into a deal um, and then have the other guy back out when he feels it's to his, his interest. We need to have- yeah, the, the, That's the Darth Vader theory of government, right? <laughs> right, we do what we like. If you don't like it, you know- I am altering move, move the deal. To Pray that I do not alter it further. <laughs> Well, I would I, I hate to see this happening because I don't think this is good for the state. You know, if I'm on Wall Street, right, and I and I hear about this kind of we're backing out of a, a tax ruling, I say to myself, what kind of you know banana republic are we talking about here? A backing out of a tax ruling. Hawaii shouldn't have a reputation like that. It already has a reputation on the regulatory side. For it to also have a reputation like that on the tax side is not good um, for our relationship with investors all around the world. I think we the problem have with, the problem with investment in Hawaii, Tom, is that when, when you when you step in something, and you and you have a precedent or a ruling or even a, a point of legislation that dumps on the investor from Wall Street or anywhere else in the world, um, you a uh, you have that investor he's unhappy and, or she or it. Um, but but you never know how many other people hear about this and say to themselves in the privacy of their private clubs, we're never going to invest in Hawaii. Hawaii is it, it does backs up backs out on its on its agreements. Yeah, you never no, I mean, know if, how if, many deals you lost. One of the one of the things that's important in the investing community, as with everywhere else, is credibility. And if you give your word as a state, uh, you should be held to it. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, f f fundamental mistakes or whatever it is, um, you know, I, I think I think the uh, you know the, the tax office is doing um, what its what its mission is. I mean, it, it's 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 unfair, but it. It's it's doing whatever it can to collect the revenue, which is what their job is, and so it's I think up to the legislature uh, to to kind of reel them in and say, okay, folks, you got to be reasonable here. We you know you guys gave your word, and we got to keep it, you know, for the for the benefit of the state. Yeah, but I think the magic the magic word here um, that overrides all of this is uh, uh, twenty. What you you said this happened this year, twenty twenty one. Yeah, uh, and that means COVID. That means COVID, and I and I think people responsible for the public fisc um, see the state under great pressure. They see this as a, a financial emergency, and it is. And the question is, how do we deal with financial emergencies? I mean, granted, it's a financial emergency. It really is. How do we deal with that? There's got to be another way. Politically, it's uh, you know it's risky to raise taxes, raise the rate of taxes, any kind of tax. You know you, you always get pushback on that politically, and maybe if you're the champion of such a bill, you don't get reelected and so forth. Um, but that's the way that you have to, in my view, the way you deal with an emergency. Um, you don't do this. This is different. And so I can understand why any tax office uh, would want to do this retroactive number because they see it as a, a source of revenue. And it is, theoretically. And maybe under some precedents, it is. But it's not good for us. There's, there's got to be a better way to raise money. Right. And, and even our laws uh, give the department discretion to specify whether or not rulings are going to have retroactive effect, and if so, how much. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think this is a good case uh, that discretion should be exercised, uh, you know, with a, with, a, with a line towards, uh, you know, not making taxpayers subject to unlimited damage. All right, it's damaging. It's damaging to business is what it is. You know, you haven't prepared, you haven't budgeted this, and all of a sudden, bang, out of nowhere. Anyway, are you finished with your discussion? Yes. All right, then I'm going to tell you a story. 
In my first year of law school, I had this teacher whose name I remember right down at the middle initial. His name was Gerhard O. W. Muller. He was German teaching it at my law school. Okay. And he said, the answer to all of these interpretation questions and you know, repeal questions and so forth is that the agency that develops the statute or the, or the rule has to go further. At the end, you know, where it says effective date, you have to say something more. You have to say, you know, on this one, gentlemen, we really mean it. That's what you gotta say. And if you really, really mean it, then just before the effective date, you should say, we really, really mean it. And that will tell future generations just how ardent you are about this law or regulation. What do you think, Tom? Well, but that means every law is going to say, and we really, really, really mean it. <laughs> You're trying to tell me it's implied anyway. <laughs> so, so query, you know, whether there's this ruling, you know, it would have been better if they said, you know, we really mean it this time. <laughs> would that have helped? <laughs> Lord only knows. Lord only knows. <laughs> Tom Yamachika, President of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Thank you so much for joining us on your show. Thank you for having me on your show. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha. Happy Christmas. <laughs>